Amen. A very famous movie with a very famous actor said probably one of the greatest lines in cinematic history. And so in this scene, this very famous actor barges in to the living room, seemingly with nothing left to give. And I don't know what it is about this line that seemed to have struck a chord with our culture and with people. But this very famous actor goes in and seemingly had lost everything. And so he looks across the room at the woman who he seemingly had driven away because of his selfishness and said this, you complete me. You complete me. Now, as, ex as insignificant as that line may have been, it has been the battle cry for our culture. And not just ours, but for a time. As long as we've been sinful, that has been the cry that something completes us. We are incomplete apart from anything. And that you complete me, that you could be anything. That you could be family, that you could be business, that you could be sports. So one thing I want to challenge all of us here is to ask ourselves, what is it or who is it that completes you? What is it or who is it that makes you whole? What is it or who is it that makes you complete? What is it or who is it that gives you joy, that gives you purpose, that satisfies you? You know, it's been widely agreed upon that one of the most prominent industries in the world, one that has been dubbed recession-proof, one that is an $11 billion a year business, the self-help industry, actually states quite the opposite. Prominent self-help gurus state this, that it isn't anything or anyone that completes you or gives you purpose or gives you direction or gives you satisfaction. It's not really in anything or anyone. The only one that can make you complete and give you satisfaction is you. You're the only one that could do that. And so people are willing to pay billions of dollars for this so-called advice that all it does is tickle your ears and right alongside it, right, right when this industry is booming year over year, you know what else is increasing? Is the rates of depression is increasing, right? Alongside it. And we ask, why? Why are the rates of depression and dissatisfaction so proportionate to the, to the rise and, and prominence of this self-help industry? Well, maybe it's because the Bible tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked. No one can understand it. Maybe it's because the Bible tells us that none of us are righteous, no, not one. The Bible tells us that apart from Christ, we are children of wrath, that we are disobedient, we are hostile in mind. Not hostile as in we're in, we're in the background. Hostile as in we're actively disengaged against God, and if left to ourselves, we would essentially self-destruct. So yeah, I think we would all be a little disappointed if the foundation of something we are seeking in order to find this joy and happiness and completeness was that. So the question for us this morning is, are you satisfied? Are you satisfied this morning? You know, do you have joy this morning? Do you have purpose in your life this morning? Do you have satisfaction in your life? Simply put, are you complete? this morning. Your brothers and sisters, the answers to these questions comes down to this, is do you know and do you believe and have given your life to Jesus Christ? Because if you have, then the answers to all of those questions are a resounding yes. But the opposite of all, uh, is also true, because if you have not believed in Jesus, if you have not believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and if you are not saved, even though you may feel a little bit of joy and even though you may feel a little bit of happiness and satisfaction, that will not last, and it will last 
but a vapor, and that $11 billion number will continue to rise. Oh, dear church, there is no searching of the soul, and there's no longing of the heart apart from Jesus Christ. So turn to Colossians chapter 2. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Complete in Christ. The title of this sermon, Complete in Christ. And my goal, my desire this morning is very simple, and it is this, to exalt the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, for he is all we need. Exalt the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, for he is all we need. Our text specifically is verses 8 through 10, but for context, please read along starting in verse 1, Colossians chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding, and the knowledge of God's mercy which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Amen. Our outline, if you're taking notes, encourage you to take notes, follows this. First, that we are given a warning. Paul is giving us a warning, and secondly, Paul is reminding us of who Christ is and what he has done. By way of context, the book of Colossians, really the message of the book is very relevant, very relevant to us today, because the book of Colossians declares that Jesus Christ is God, that in Christ is the fullness of of God. Christ is all that God is, and there is no shortage of deity in Jesus Christ. So if you are a Christian this morning, and Jesus Christ is living in you this morning, you have been given everything that you need. Whether it be for life or for godliness, you've been given it all. You don't need a mystical encounter like the book of Colossians was, or like the false teachers in Colossae were saying. You don't need um, religious asceticism. You don't need even additional philosophy. You don't need an emotional experience to lift you high up into the heavens as if you've attained a higher level of spirituality. You don't need any of that. Paul is saying, no, no, no. Be, be, be forewarned, Christians. All you need is Christ. He's all you need. You don't need a second blessing because you have Jesus Christ already. You don't need a second work of grace, you already have Jesus Christ. Because you, you have everything in Christ, what more could you possibly want? You have everything. But the Colossians were being told something different. Being told something different. Hey, church in Colossae, you need something more than just Jesus. Yeah, you need Jesus, but something more to satisfy you. You need more than him to complete you. You need traditions. You need, you need the worship of angels. You need to recuse yourself. You need to mutilate your body as a form of sacrifice for you to attain this completeness. Oh, you need all these things. And so Paul, this is considered one of Paul's prison epistles because he's writing this in Rome. Paul hadn't even been to the church in Colossae. But no, this report came back to him saying, hey, this is the teaching that's coming out. So Paul, while in prison, writes this to warn. To warn the believers. 
Paul's saying, no, you don't, need, you don't need dreams. You don't need visions. You don't need this additional philosophy to supplement Jesus Christ because he is sufficient. In him, you don't lack anything. You have his word, Paul says. You have his spirit. Oh, you, you have this reality of knowing more of Christ, and that is more valuable than gold. And so Paul is right-sizing the believers' minds. He's correcting their minds. You don't need anything else, Christian. All you need is Christ. So back to our text here in verse 8. It says this, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to to Christ. Firstly, Christian, be warned. Be warned. Philosophy here means generally the love of wisdom. Saying, see to it that no one takes you captive. You know what that word also means? It means to be kidnapped. You know when someone gets kidnapped, it's sudden. You know when someone gets taken captive and when someone is kidnapped, you never saw it coming. That's why Paul is saying, see to it that you don't get kidnapped by philosophy, by this love for wisdom. And that in, this, in this context, it includes the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and even the Essenes and all of what they believe in this, this philosophical outlook, this life worldview that you need to take what the Bible says and add it to some tradition and you, you mishmash all that together. And then only if you do that, then Christ will be satisfied with you. Only if you take this pagan belief and this tradition of do not handle and do not touch and do not taste and do not eat, if you take that, in addition to what Christ has done on the cross, then you would have reached spiritual maturity. Oh, Paul's saying, don't be kidnapped. Don't be kidnapped, because it happens suddenly without you even knowing. And so we have a warning here for us. And Paul even describes it. He says, actually, not philosophy. It is empty deceit. It is vain deceit. You know, there is nothing, dear saints, that these teachings are offering you. There's nothing that, that this offers you. Matter of fact, the, the word there, when you, when you break that out, that empty deceit, it actually means fraud. It's a fraud. Or it's a trick. Someone played a trick on you. But Paul's saying, be, be weary of this, that no one takes you captive. You know, it's hard. It's hard for false teachers to be read of, readily noticeable. Right? Because in verse 23, if you, if you go a little bit further in chapter 2, verse 23 says this. Verse 23 says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they, false teachings, are of no value, are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Do you see there? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom. You see, I mean, it's easy enough if someone came here with a Bible that's burning. And then you think back and think, yeah, I think you're a false teacher. <laughs> but, but it doesn't come across that way because it has the appearance of wisdom. Galatians chapter 5 says a little leaven leavens the whole lump, so it won't be readily noticeable, dear church. No, false teachers uh, have these smooth words. It's partial truth mixed with other things that sound so nice. If you just turn on the TV, you think about all of these prosperity Preachers, they have, a, they have a kindness to them, don't they? You know, if you just kind of watch, they have, a, they have a kindness to them. Even how they, whether it's choreographed or not, even how they smile. They're just so aloof. Not, not a hair misplaced. Oh, they're, 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 they're smooth. They don't stutter. Oh, but when you truly listen, Paul is saying, it's just empty philosophy. It's, a, it's of no value. It's of no 
value. And Paul says in the remaining verse 8 that all false, teacher, false teaching, I should say, will take on this particular characteristic that ties them all together, that it is not according to Christ. Whether it's according to tradition, that you have to do this. Christian, you have to do this tradition in order to attain satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Christian, you have to do this, fill in the blank. Christian, you are guilted now into some begrudging type of submission that if you don't do these outward traditions, then you won't attain a right standing with God. Is it according to, tradi to, to tradition? And what's unfortunate is we get plenty, plenty of religious teaching that puts tradition above even our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you see, that's why our Lord is after the heart. See, the Lord isn't after what's on the outside. No, he's after the heart. That's why when, when any of you, when you, when you put your faith in Christ and when you, when you bowed the knee, it was your heart that Christ transformed. It was your heart from the inside out. It was your heart that he, that, that was stone and he gave it a heart of flesh, which is why your outlook on life is different. Yeah, you may still struggle, you may still sin, and that growth can seem like it's stagnant, but no, a true Christian, a true Christian will be always changed. Oh, a true Christian will change because their heart is new, they've been created anew. Their heart has been purified, so the faculties now are different. Their sensitivities now are different. They've never seen the world like this before in this renewed mind now is able to detect teaching that is taking away from the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Paul also says there the elemental spirits of the world. Some of your translations may say elementary principles. Elementary principles of the world. You know, false teaching should sound very basic to you sound very basic. Not deep, not very, it, it's, it's teaching that is very shallow. You know what elementary principles mean in this context? It means ABCs. It means ABCs. Not, not the writing of it, but the sounding of it. Essentially what it means is baby talk. You ever had a baby talk to you? Okay. However cute they are, you don't understand a word they say. It's a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but they're so cute. But they're talking to you, and I have a, a two-year-old now who's talking, who's talking. And, and in, in a lighter way, I, I'm taken captive. You know, she, she says these things. I have no clue what she's saying, but all of a sudden, I find myself grabbing a chocolate and just giving it to her. She's taking me captive. But that's what it should sound like. When you hear teaching that is not according to Christ, it should sound like baby talk. I don't understand that. What, what is he saying? Paul's saying that's what it sounds like. Can't understand it. It's elementary. It's very shallow. It's not very deep. And it's not according to Christ. And you know that implies something. It implies that you know the teachings of Christ. It implies that you know who Christ is. And our Lord asked the Apostle Peter... Do you know who I am, or who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Is that you this morning? Can you say that? Like, can you say that and mean it because you live it? That you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, it implies that you know the teachings about Christ. You know what else it implies is that you read of him. You know what it implies that you don't forsake the fellowship, you don't forsake coming together, worshiping corporately. It implies that you are living for him. It implies that you're pursuing holiness. Otherwise, how would you be able to tell the difference? How? Is one Sunday a week, one day a week, where you hear the word of God, is that enough? Because these elementary principles of the world doesn't work one day a week. And so Paul's saying, don't be kidnapped, Christian. 
Oh, you have to stay on guard. A recent nationwide article um, from last month outlined and highlighted a particular church in Omaha, Nebraska. And this single church with a financial backing of $65 million has combined Judaism, Christianity, and Islam under one congregation. This is called the Tri-Faith Initiative. Tri-Faith Initiative. You know, it wasn't just Christianity and Islam, which is where we got chris Lam. Now you add one more. And surely it won't stop at Tri-Faith Initiative. I'm sure it'll be the Quad Faith Initiative, and so on and so forth. But this particular Tri-Faith Initiative, one of the leaders stated this. We didn't create this to tolerate each other. We are doing this for the betterment of humanity. Now how can you argue with that? So if you were to speak against the betterment of humanity, you see how it comes across so wise. But what is happening here is that Jesus Christ has been merged with teachings that minimize him. Jesus Christ has been clumped together as if he's just but one of the options. He's just one of the options. He's been, he's been lumped in with with religious traditions and faiths that question his very deity. Oh, this tri-faith initiative, all it does is to say that Christ is alone. Christ alone is not enough. Christ alone is not enough, but it is masked behind this purpose of bettering humanity. So don't you dare speak against such a wonderful vision, such a wonderful goal. Oh, it appears to be wise, but it is of no value. No value. See to it, brothers and sisters, that you are not taken captive. Not taken captive. So Paul first warns us in verse 8. Now in verses 9 and 10, he reminds us of who Christ is and what he has done. Verse 9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily You know, in this context, he means Christ, that in Christ are found not just the attributes of God. In Christ are not just the works of God, but in Christ what you find is the very essence of God. That's what you find in the fullness of deity that dwells in him in bodily form. He just doesn't look like God. No, he is God. He's the second person of the Trinity in the flesh. He just doesn't do the work of God. His essence exudes that he is. God, there's nothing ungodlike. Nothing ungodlike about Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul says. And so any teaching about Christ which says anything less than that is not according to the scriptures. In him, he says, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. So even when other teachers compliment Jesus Christ by saying he's a great prophet, oh, they don't honor him. Oh, even when 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 teachers compliment Jesus Christ, oh, he was a great teacher. Oh, they don't honor him because he's not just a great prophet or just a great teacher, the great king. Oh, no, he's a son of Oh, he is God in the flesh because the fullness of deity dwells in him. And Paul reminds us of this truth. He reminds us of this because if you are convinced of that truth, if you are convinced that Jesus Christ is God, then why would you need to go anywhere else to experience life and to experience salvation? Why would you need to go anywhere else to experience victory in this world and why would you need to go to anyone else or anywhere else to experience true freedom that only Jesus Christ can give he's it and you know the only reason we can have such a confidence such an eternal confidence in Christ is because of the work that he has done it is nothing of what we have done 
at all. All we have offered are filthy rags. It's everything of what Christ has done. Because when Christ became man, when Christ took on the form of man and came down and didn't count equality with God, a thing to be grasped but humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, Christ became the perfect mediator between God and man. He had a divine will, and he also had a human will. In Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, tells us this, which is why we can have confidence that he is supreme and that he's all-sufficient, because it says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, there's a reason. You ever thought about this? There's a reason why Jesus just didn't come down as a fully grown human being quickly died on the cross and go back and ascend to heaven. You ever think about that? There's a reason why he came as a baby and grew up because he can experience everything you have experienced. Oh, Jesus lived this life that we could not live and he died the death that we deserve to die. Adam was our first representative and he fell into sin and that lineage of sin now taints humanity and has infected all of us and we were created dear church we are created for god's glory but rather than glorifying god sinful man we took matters into our own hands we took matters into our own hands and we begun to glorify not only ourselves but we we started to seek anything and everything for this satisfaction we even elevated knowledge and traditions and philosophies above god because we thought that we can find joy and satisfaction and completeness in all these things. Oh, our first res representative in Adam disobeyed God. Oh, but not our second one. Oh, you can have confidence in Christ. Why? Because he became the obedient representative. He became the pure substitute Christ became the propitiation. Christ became this payment required to fully satisfy God's wrath against sin. And do you know what Christ's obedience led him to? It's, a, it's an interesting study within the Gospels as you read about, you know, we talk a lot about being obedient, you know, and, and, and walking in the Spirit and growing and being sanctified when we step back and think about Jesus Christ, you know what his obedience, him being obedient to the Father led him to? You know, his obedience led him to hunger. Led him to hunger. You know, his being obedient to God, him desiring to glorify God above all else, led him to be rejected. You know that? It led even his own family and his brothers to declare that he was crazy. They declared him that he's out of his mind. So the only one that was ever in his right mind was declared out of his mind. Oh, his obedience led him to be ridiculed. Oh, he, he has a demon. He has a demon. You know what his obedience led him to? It led him to discouragement. John chapter 6 are you going to leave me as well? Are you going to leave me as well? You know what else his obedience led him to? Homelessness. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Oh yeah, it talks of extreme. But see, there's no other way with Jesus Christ. He either is or he isn't in your life. It led him to homelessness. You know what else his obedience led him to? Betrayal. 
It led him to be betrayed, and his obedience led him to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives, saying this, Father, if you are willing, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, false teachers love that line. They love that verse because they say, see, Jesus didn't want to do it. Jesus Christ didn't want to die for you because he said, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. See, he didn't want to do it. He had doubts. Your God has doubts. I would say no. That's, it's actually quite the opposite because this, Jesus saying, remove this cup from me, you know what it proves? It proves for us that Jesus was actually fully man. It proves that he's man, because if he didn't make those petitions, then we would seriously question his sinlessness. Or we would question any sensibility that he would have as a human being. Or we would question that, because no one had a more appropriate, a more, a more right, a more intimate view of not only the holiness of God, but the wrath of God. No one had a more clearer view than Jesus Oh no, Adam, when he sinned, oh, he hid from God. But Jesus, who is sinless, who is pure, didn't hide from God's wrath. Oh no, he willingly, he didn't shrink back from it. Oh, so the only appropriate response was remove this cup. Why? Because Jesus, up until this point, all he had ever known was the, the smile of the Father. All, all Jesus had ever known up until that point was the smile and the favor of God and the thought. Jesus' thought that God would, would, would pour his wrath upon him. Do you not think Jesus knew about the plagues in Egypt and the, and the, and the killing of the firstborn? Oh, he, he knew clearly what was about to happen. Oh, so all that was getting ready to be poured out on him. And so, no, it wasn't a doubt. It was just that, that thought was so overwhelming. And then he says, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, he made it to the cross. Oh, he made it to the cross. And did you know that he willingly did that? You know, it's a little bit different when you're dragged or you're forced to do something, right? When you're forced to do something you don't want to do, you actually do it half-heartedly. It's just, uh, it's outward. It's outward. There's no genuineness about it. It's all outward. Oh, did you know Jesus did that willingly? That he willingly obeyed, that led him to his death, and he freely did that. Because the scriptures tell us that no one takes his life from him. He lays it down on his own accord. Oh, he wasn't forced to do that. Which is why in verse 10, when Paul says, and you have been filled in him, you can also say you have been brought to fullness in him. You have been made complete, dear Christian, because of what Christ has done. Because in him all the fullness of deity dwells. We are now complete in him. There is nothing that we need to be spiritually grown. There is nothing that we need to be spiritually prospered outside of his word, outside of Christ. And we don't need to go anywhere else. There's no other means that Christ has provided, other than the word, other than fellowship, and what we would call the means of grace. That's what the Lord has provided for us. He's provided ministries, even within this church, to minister to you when you are down, when you're discouraged. Oh, that's by his design. Nothing else needs to be added for you to be complete. You know, in love, I want to say this, that if you're not a Christian, this morning, you're incomplete this morning. You're incomplete. If you are a Christian and you are feeling incomplete, it's maybe because you're pursuing things that are not eternal. Maybe it's because you're pursuing things that ultimately will not satisfy you. You know, Blaise Pascal famously wrote that all of us has a God-shaped void. In our lives. I'm going to read from him. Quote, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, 
of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, that none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. So are you filling your mind, dear church? Are you filling your mind with the things that are above? You know, I'm going to read a number of verses here. And I just want you to listen. And I want you to pick up maybe a theme. Pick up a theme of what these verses are teaching us. Matthew chapter 9, verse 22 says this. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Translated, complete. Instantly made complete. Matthew chapter 12, verse 13 says this. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, says this. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Instantly. John chapter 5, afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. It was Jesus who had made him complete. Acts chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says this. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well, complete. So what do you see? When Jesus heals someone, you know, that word healed is where we get the word hygiene. Being made healthy. When Jesus healed someone, he made them healthy, he made them entirely well, he completed them instantly. Oh, this is the way Jesus heals spiritually. No, this is why we can have such a confidence that we are complete in Christ and we are a new creation. But a thought in your mind could be, why do I still struggle with sin then? If I've been made complete in Christ and if I'm a new creation, why do I still sin? It's a great question. Because while we have new hearts, we have old bodies. While we have new hearts, we have old bodies, but take heart, dear saints, Christ has defeated death, and if we know that only in him we are complete, then we can run to him, because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. He says in 1 John that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and be encouraged, dear church, that Christ has already triumphed. Christ has already disarmed the rulers and authorities. John chapter 1, verse 16 says, from his fullness, not ours, but his, we have all received grace upon grace. So in Christ, and only in Christ, we have been made full. You know when Christ, when, when Christ hung on that cross and he said those words, it is finished. Oh, he meant it. Oh, it is finished, Christ says. It is complete. Nothing more needs to happen. We're done. Trust in me. I'm sufficient for you. Do you know Christ this morning? Do you know Jesus this morning? And not a knowing for knowledge's sake, because the scriptures tell us even even the demons and the devil knows Jesus. Even they know Jesus. Oh, but do you know 
Jesus as in an intimate knowledge because he has changed your life. Do you know him? Well, we need to be reminded of Christ, don't we? You know, does the reality of Christ, does the reality of Christ and what he has done and the reality of Christ and who he is, the fact that we can find sufficiency in him, does that do anything for you? You know, does that do anything for you? Does it, does it even, at the minimum, nudge you? Does it motivate you? Or are you too busy? Are you too busy with other things? Are you too busy with other things that five, ten minutes daily in the Word of God can somehow be so easily pushed to the side because I'm too busy? Trust that's something we all struggle with. We have seasons of doubt. We have seasons of loneliness. But within those seasons of even questioning, we have to ask ourselves, you know, do I believe Christ to be sufficient to meet all of my needs? Do I believe him to be sufficient to meet all of my needs? And my challenge to you is if you feel that God is not answering that prayer, to look back in your life and to think, you know what? If I look back in my life, can I actually pinpoint a time where Christ was not faithful to me. Because I trust that you can't. Oh, he's faithful. And he provides. And he gives. Because in him is fullness of joy. You know, that's why Christ came. You know, it's so backwards that often those who don't believe in Jesus look at Christianity and say it's just a bunch of rules or a bunch of hypocrites or, you know, I don't want to believe in that because you live the same way you live anyway. So I just, I just rather have fun. Oh no, when Christ captivates you, oh, you can't, you can't walk away from that experience with Jesus and be the same person. It's not possible. Oh, may Christ never be an accessory just an additional piece. That's why Paul's reminding us, you're complete in him. You don't lack anything in Jesus. So dear church, if it is not according to Christ, be on guard. Let's take heed of the warning. Don't be taken captive by it. Don't be kidnapped by it. There's no need to pay into the $11 billion industry because Christ has already paid the ultimate price. Oh, he paid it with his life. He's already paid the price, which is why you can read Isaiah 55 and we can read these words and say, Amen. That's what my Savior has done. Isaiah 55 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. How can we buy and eat when we have no money? Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Oh, Christ has done it all. We are complete in Christ we need not anything else but him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are all we need. You are fully sufficient for our salvation, our life, our needs. You are worthy to be exalted and proclaimed. Lord, if there be anyone here who does, who does not know you, may they bow the knee and realize that this life has nothing to offer them. Oh, satisfaction and joy and purpose can only be found in Christ alone. Oh, strengthen your people. May this congregation be one that hates sin. May this congregation be one that does not pay attention to anything that is not according to Christ. Oh, may, the, may this church be a beacon of light in the community that you have placed us. Oh, we, all, we owe it all to you. 
It is in Christ, not in us. Oh, we are so thankful. Father, if, if all we had was you, that is enough. We pray these things in his name. Well